I'd like to welcome everyone to our Analog Overview webinar today, April 6, 2011. My name is Jason Letary. I'm going to be doing the presenting today. And I'm also here with Anthony Nicolaitis, who will be answering any questions that you may have. We'll be going over the types of transducers, the principles of linearization, as well as trends and graphs. So let's get right going into Going over the voltage sensors, support 0 to 10 volts. We have current where we can support either a 0 to 20 milliamp or also a uh, 4 to 20 milliamp sensor supported as well. We have temperature options for thermal couples and RTDs. And there's a screenshot here as well of the hardware configuration. And we'll take a look at this later in the demo program, but it's just another uh, quick view of the types of sensors we support, the types of ter thermal couples, whether they're type B, E, J, uh, those different ranges really just support different uh, temperature limits that are defined by the type of sensor. But we support any of these uh, type letters, thermocouples, as well as the RTDs PT100, um, PT1000. So if you're ever in question about the the type of sensor that we support on a specific model of a controller. You can find all of that relevant information in the spec sheet. Uh, this is an excerpt for the analog input section. And you can see it will always show the resolution of the sensor, um, as well as the input impedance we support, and the, the, um, the type of conversion method as well for the analog to digital, with whether it's excessive approximation or um, there's different types that we support, but generally the main information that you'd want to find in the spec sheet is the type of analog input. Um, not all of our inputs will do voltage and current. Sometimes they'll do both. Sometimes they'll only do one, depending on the number of inputs on the controller. But you can always find definitive information in the spec sheet for the actual model of the controller, or also snap-on I.O. or expansion I.O. that you're trying to utilize. In this particular case, you'll see there's four inputs um, and it supports a 14-bit resolution. Um, and we'll explain how the resolution is relevant to the actual application and the programming um, in a little bit. But generally, we'll have either 10-bit, uh, 12-bit, or 14-bit as a maximum resolution that is supported on the analog inputs. So as far as linearization, when you read the sensor information in, whether it's voltage or current, it's going to be converted into either a 12-bit or 14-bit, 10-bit value as we discussed before. But um, the way that you need to be able to change those bit values into meaningful engineering units is via linearization. So this graph here shows how linearization actually works. When you're in the hardware configuration, you have to define a memory integer, um, some sort of operand to hold the value that's being read into the controller. And the value that actually comes into the controller will be in bit values, um, which you can see in the graph here. If we have, let's say, zero volts on our sensor, the operand that's assigned in VisiLogic will also have a zero in it. Zero is equal to zero bits. Uh, if you have a 12-bit linearization, 12-bit scaling factor, and 10 volts on the sensor, inside the register in VisiLogic, it will display 4,095 bits. Um, and same is true for current. Zero is always equal to zero. So even if you're using a 4 to 20 milliamp sensor, uh, your zero volts will be, or zero milliamps rather, will be zero bits. Your 4 milliamps will be 819 bits, and your 20 milliamp will be 4,095. So you don't have to actually do any of these conversions. The linearization function block will handle all of the advanced mathematical formulas. Um, so there's no, no really extra work that you have to do besides defining the limits in the linearization block, which we'll take a look at. Um, but you can find the scaling factor, whether it's 12-bit, 14-bit, within the spec sheet. And then the spec sheet will also always list the maximum value as well we saw before. Um, if it's 14-bit, you know, it'll be 16,383 as the max value, or in this case with 12-bit, the maximum value is 4,095. And the formula, basic formula here as well, 2 to the n minus, well, minus 1 
If you have 12-bit, it's 2 to the 12th. Minus 1 gives you 4,095 is the maximum value. So that's, that's how you can always calculate it, but once again, it can always be found in the spec sheet as well to make things easier. We'll take a look at today as well, graphical representation of data. So if you have the analog input coming in and it's been scaled, you want to show that on the HMI of the controller. We have the option for trends as well as we'll look at the, the meters and bar graphs as well. But the trends allow you to have um, on a 570 or 560, 1040, a total of eight trends with eight curves per trend. So you can have essentially eight different graphic variables, eight different trend values with eight curves on each line. So that gives you a, an ability to represent a total of 64 you know, memory integer values that are linked to analog input values. We'll take a look at how to set that up as well. So that's, that's the overview of the presentation for the PowerPoint. We'll take a quick look at a demo now for an application that I've written. I'll pull it up in Remote Operator. Let's make it full screen so everyone can see. Okay, so this um, application I wrote for 1040, it's really the same whether any controller you're using, a 570, 350, 130, uh, the logic will be the same. I just happen to use a 1040. And in this particular uh, demo application, I'll show you how I have it wired up. I'm using a snap-in, a V218E4XB, and what I have configured here is wiring the analog output directly into the analog input. So you can see the A out 0 is wired into the analog input 0, and the, the ground is also wired to the ground as well. But uh, the analog output is driving the analog input and it just needs to be powered with 24 volts and 0 volts as well. So if you wanted to actually try this experiment out for yourself later, um, you can use any, like I said, any controller or any snap -in. The main idea behind this application, though, is just using the analog output to feed into the analog input. So on the screen, we can see couple of different variables on the bottom left hand side is the trends window. The trends will show history of the, the different values. We have a meter value. You could also use a bar graph just to represent the, the voltage value. I have zero volts right now, which is also equivalent to zero bits. So this is showing the, the raw value that's coming into the analog input as bit values in the lower right hand side and the value on the upper right hand side of the screen is the voltage that's actually already been scaled or linearized. So if I arrow up, you can see as I continue up 0 0.8, 0 0.9, the trends variable is increasing, the meter is increasing, as well as the bit values. So from our linearization function, for example, 2.9 volts is equal to 1183 bits. Now this math for the conversion from bits to voltage, as I mentioned before, is being handled by the linearization function block. So it's pretty easy to set up. And I also made it so you can punch in a voltage value. If I want to punch in you know, 9 volts, you can do that as well. And you can see the, the trend graph jumped up sharply. Or if I scale it back down, you can see the meter and the trend variable are also decreasing as I'm tapping. I guess you can't see them right now, but I'm tapping the, the uh, arrow down, or if I tap the arrow up, the voltage, as well as the bit values, will start increasing. So that's really just a quick demonstration of the, the capabilities for the analog input and graphically representing that with either a meter or also a, a trend variable. So we'll take a look at now how this application is written. Let me exit out of here. And I'll switch, I'll stop this, and I'll switch over to VisiLogic. So the first thing you need to do when you want to have a project use an analog input or an analog output, 
you need to make sure that you configure that in the hardware configuration. So if you go to the view menu and then hardware config, we can take a look and see. You can see I've defined a Vision 1040 and a V218 E3 or E4XB snap-on. It's, it's the same in the software. So I have the options for my digital inputs and outputs. I haven't defined any here. We're not really concerned about that at this point. But if I click on the Analog Inputs tab, you can see I've defined the input type as a 0 to 10 volts. If I select the drop-down, same as the screenshot in the PowerPoint earlier. There's the different types of, of inputs or thermocouples, voltage that you can select. I'll leave it on 0 to 10. You have the option of defining a filter as well. No filter, low strength, medium, high. Uh, all this is really doing is if you have a sensor that's fluctuating slightly, you can select the, the software filter here, which basically just takes the average of the last couple of readings and you know it calculates that average so you can eliminate any sort of you know jittering input or, or slightly fluctuating value just so it looks more presentable for any sort of calculations or also on the HMI screen as well. So it, if you have it on low, you know, medium or high or none are the different options. You can see as well I have it on 12-bit scaling mode. On some of the controllers and some of the snap-ons, it allows you to switch between 12 or 14-bit. Why would you want to use one over the other? Um, the 12-bit is going to be a faster calculation but it's also less accurate. If you have the 14-bit resolution, you know, your max bit value is 16,383 versus, you know, 4,095 with the 12-bit. So the 12-bit is a faster calculation, faster input response, but again, the 14-bit would be more accurate value for your sensor. So I'll leave